Now I want to bring in CNN law enforcement analyst Harry Houck, CNN legal analyst Laura Coates, and jury consultant Joellen Demetrius. Thank you uh, so much. I mean, this is a very uh, tough and emotional case, as you can see there. Joellen, you first. This seems to have come down to one juror who just could not convict. But lawyers say they want someone on the jury who will stand up for their convictions and not be swayed by the pressure of the rest of the group. Is that what happened here? I think it's very clearly what happened. Uh, we don't know anything about this particular juror, what his background is, how he may have answered uh, what dire questions if there was a juror questionnaire. But very clearly, this was a gentleman who uh, believed in whatever his particular persuasion was and was not going to change his mind no matter what the pressure was being placed on not only by his fellow jurors, but also by the judge. Mm -hmm. When the judge gives an Allen charge, basically he's saying to the jury, look folks, uh, we have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in this uh, lawsuit. Another case would have to be tried if there is a mistrial, and you really need to go back and make a decision. And yet, one man, for whatever reason, stood up and said, no, I cannot uh, go with a vote of, uh, of uh, guilt. Hey, Joellen, can you, uh, I've heard this juror referred to as a stealth juror. Can you explain what that is and whether it fits this case? Oh, certainly, Don. Uh, a stealth juror is someone who um, comes in who may be hiding information about their background. Uh, maybe he has law enforcement in his background. Maybe something happened in his uh, life that he did not share or the attorneys did not ask the right question during the voir dire process. And they come into the jury with one uh, uh, one thing in mind, and in his case, a person could say, well, his uh, preconception was to acquit this particular officer. So mm -hmm. that's generally what a stealth juror is. Laura, you now, on Friday, it appeared that there was one holdout juror. Today, other jurors said that they were not unanimous. What do you think happened with this jury? Well, I think that the weekend was a time for them to reflect further, and I think what really happened here is you're seeing what happens when juries are confronted with the idea of a police officer on trial. One of the, the key questions that every prosecutor and defense attorney will ask in a voir dire is whether or not the jury will give more weight to testimony of an officer over that of a civilian. And the reason they do that is because the answer usually is yes. People are going to give a lot more weight to an officer. And when the officer is a defendant, there is this level of incredulity that they say, I don't want to believe that there is somebody in uniform who would do this. And when you read the juror's note, what but piqued my interest the most was the statement of, based on the choices that I have, I can't convict. What it seemed to me is that you had a juror who said, I don't feel comfortable with a homicide or a murder charge. There has been much less for this particular officer. Mm, it's interesting. I wonder if, the, if it, the, do you think the jury was, do you think the charges were correct against the officer? I think that they were, but I think that one of the strategic errors that the prosecution may have made, and only judging from the questions they asked, was that they originally came in with a murder charge, mm -hmm. and they allowed the jury to then hear a voluntary manslaughter charge. Mm -hmm. Very, very different charge based on what the intent of the officer was and the sentence involved, which I think led the jury to believe maybe there's some reason to doubt that there is some basis to just have a straight murder charge. And you saw that evidence by the fact that the jurors then asked today, well, why did you give us the manslaughter charge to consider as opposed to murder? It was very telling. Interesting. Harry, I also find it interesting because you have said from the start that you could not condone the shooting. Correct. But I want you to listen. This is what Slager said on the stand, and then we'll talk about it. Right. <clears throat> In my mind, fear, I'm scared. With everything leading up to this, from the run to not cooperating, the fight on the ground, and Mr. Scott with the taser coming after me while we were on the ground in the chest area, and then us breaking apart as we're standing up, and then coming at me again. You know, it was total fear that Mr. Scott didn't stop, continued to come towards me. Unarmed, running away from the officer, not towards him. Does his defense make sense to you? Do you buy it? He hasn't got much of a defense at all. Um, I, am, I am shocked 
that we didn't get a conviction in this case. I mean, that video is so clear. I think what might have happened here in this case is either the judge um, who uh, gave them the information regarding the laws and the stipulations of the laws might have done something wrong, for all I know. All right, maybe the district attorney didn't go across, uh, uh, didn't make his case good enough. Uh, the fact is that we, we had 11 jurors that were for conviction, all right, and one against it. That's the problem with jurors. You know, you never know how people are going to think. You know, to me and to any police officer watching this video and watching this trial, you got to say to yourself, this is a bad shoot, mm -hmm. all right? This officer needs to go to jail for what he did. I don't know what was going on through in his, his mind when he fired at that man who was run. I've been in that situation you dozens You said you've been in a situation. You said oh, yeah. a million times it was recorded. A million I've been in times. Situation. So what do you think the root problem was here? Was it bad training? Was it Because he said he was in fear. And oftentimes, that's what happens in these cases. Most times, I was in fear. I was in fear right. of my life, and that's why I did what I right. did. Right. I mean, it's clear he was, you know, it, he might have been in fear in his own mind, but still, even if he was in fear in his own mind, he did not have, the law says you cannot shoot at a fleeing felon. All right. it's, it's basically, you know, he did not have a weapon in his hand. All right. The fact that even in the video, Officer Schlager went back and picked something up and put it down, mm -hmm. down near the body. I mean, you, you could see clearly, even the way he's trying to articulate um, in, in the trial exactly what his fear was. I'm sitting there, I'm listening, I'm going, like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing makes any sense to a police officer that has been through this type of thing before. Yeah, it's, does this show the difficulty, Laura, in, in um, convicting an officer uh, in these types of cases? Absolutely. I mean, you have Supreme Court precedent that allows a lot of deference to officers to tell them to define what to them is a sense of fear, what's reasonable for that officer. And as Harry's talking about, and as anybody with eyes saw the videotape looks at and sees a man 18 feet apart from the officer when he's first shot, it's hard to believe that there's actually reasonable fear. But still, not only does Supreme Court give that deference, everyday civilians on the jury will also say to themselves, I've got to believe a different narrative here. Now, that seems very at odds with what we actually believe in our common sense, and that's why it's so frustrating, because remember, Don, reasonable doubt has to first be reasonable. It's not beyond all shadow of any scintilla of evidence. It's what's reasonable here. And I think it's very clear that it was not a reasonable defense, but them's the breaks when it comes to juries. You have to have unanimity, and frankly, in this case, I think with a new trial, perhaps a new jury, and perhaps in the federal trial that's coming up, you will be able to achieve that one way or the other. Laura, Joel, and Harry, thank you very much. I appreciate it.